Up next, a look at Imhotep, Builder of Egypt from Cosmos Games. All right, first off, fair warning, Imhotep has nothing to do with The Mummy or Brandon Fraser. Imhotep, Builder of Egypt is an Egyptian-themed monument-building board game designed by Phil Walker Harding, featuring art by Miguel Coimbra and Michaela Kiente, or Klein, Killen, I apologize for the name there. Uh, published by Thames and Cosmos in, 29, in 2016, I think it was. I got the wrong date there completely. 2016, uh, yeah. 2016, yeah. I was right on my, my notes were wrong, bad mode, which means my blog post is probably wrong. It probably says 2019. It was published in 2016. I played it for the first time in 2019. Uh, plays two to four players with most games taking well under an hour. And I think that is uh, Michaela Kainla. Kainla? Yeah, Kainla. maybe. Kainla is, I believe, the pronunciation. All right. But... Again, I don't know what country yeah. she's they are Probably there Germany, from, but we'll who knows. So thank you for the the <laughs> correction there, even though we still may be wrong. Yeah. Uh, all right. So for those of who haven't checked out our unboxing video on YouTube, what's in the box? All right. First off, you got an eleven page rule book, which is sitting on top of a bunch of punch boards. Rule books, full color, lots of examples, features tons of pictures that are actual gameplay components. Actual rules of the game are only two pages. The rest of the book are how to score each of the various boards that are in this game. The punch boards are some of the best cut I have ever touched. Boards and bits were falling off of these as I was trying to unbox the game. Stuff was falling on the floor when I was trying to show off the components on this one. By the time I was done unboxing video, most of the stuff had already been punched. Uh, cardboard's pretty much your standard thickness. Artwork's all very clear, nice and crisp, with a nice unifying sandy yellow uh, desert-y theme to everything. Uh, main boards is notable that they're two sided with A and B sides. So, and I'm I'm looking at the cubes. These could very well just be the cubes from uh, Minecraft. I mean, they are you know yep. same yep. color. I haven't gotten to the cubes yet, yeah. but yes, yeah, they, I think they're the same size. So under the punch boards, uh, there's a really uniquely shaped box insert that's covered in all kinds of pretty images, and I don't get it because it serves no purpose whatsoever. It's like a weird oblong kind of shape, so it makes it the box not square anymore. I'd, maybe they were trying to go for a quarry pit feel. I don't know. Well, it's kind of pretty. There's no purpose to it. And I got to wonder, could my game have been a bit cheaper if they had skipped this superfluous add-on? There's no point. I would have much preferred somewhere to actually put the components in the game. Like, there's a deck of cards. Give me somewhere to put the cards. Um, this is the small rant compared to what I kind of went off about this on the unboxing video. I, I was unimpressed by this insert, to say the least. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's it's it, for to just to give you give people a better picture who are listening. Uh, imagine if you take your box and then you shrink it down a little bit and turn it forty five degrees inside your other box. Yeah, that's what you're left with. Um, so you you they they massively just basically cut off all four corners of the box for no reason other than art. Yeah, I I just. I, I don't understand why. Now, in this little pit is a bunch of noteworthy cubes. Sean already mentioned these. These are huge compared to standard resource cubes. Like, these are not the cubes you get in any of your standard Euro games. Uh, these are painted wood. I'm going to guess they're about an inch and a half, inch and a quarter square. Uh, they're in four different colors, and there are a ton of them. Then there are the cards I mentioned. These are Hobbit-sized cards. Not a huge fan of Hobbit-sized cards. I prefer full-size cards, but they're, they're fine. They're good quick thickness, good quality. They're not overly slippery or anything. Uh, there's two different sets in the deck, market cards and boat cards. Final thing you get are plastic baggies, which are appreciated, especially because you gave me such a dumb box insert. Well, at, at least companies seem to be of late anyway, knock on wood, getting the idea that at the very, the very least thing you can do for your game is give us some Ziplocs. You know, I mean, even if nothing else comes in there, Give us some Ziplocs so the box isn't a disaster. Yes, yes. So... So now that you know what you get, how do you play? All right, so in Imhotep, you are builders in Egypt trying to impress uh, the pharaoh Imhotep by moving stone from the quarry to build various monuments, moving stone by boat. Each monument is represented by a different central playing board, and there are four monument boards in the base game, and there's a market board. Each of these is also two-sided. Players are going to uh, 
The market board has where the cards go, where players can earn end game scoring cards and some rule breaking abilities. You can play with the boards laid out in any combination of A and B sides, though the game does recommend you start with A sides and move on to the B sides once you know the game. Uh, and these aren't big. I mean, these are when it, when it comes to player board sizes. I mean, these aren't even the size of a, a terraforming Mars. No, board, no, are, they're, they're small. But once you put them together, it, it's it's like uh, it's like a multi part center board central area where you build basically your your different work stations that, that the boats can stop right. at. But it's not a table hog by any means. No, not at all. Uh, the first time we played it was at a bar on a bar table. So there we go. Uh, each round starts by putting out a number of boats. These are little tiles that represent has space for cubes on them for your cubes. Boats either fit one to four cubes. Uh, each turn, players are going to take one action. They're either going to get more stone from the quarry, taking up to three cubes of their color, but only if they have room, because you can only hold five. Or load a boat by taking one of the cubes that's in your personal supply and putting it on a boat. Note you can put it anywhere on any one of the boats in any of the spots that isn't already taken, and each boat only has so much room. Or you can sail a boat. You take one of the boats that has a minimum amount of stone on it, and that varies by the size, and move it to one of the boards. Basically, the, the, they dock to it. There's a little spot where they kind of slot in. And then you unload the boat from front to back, which matters, because the order the cubes come out is a big part of scoring in the game. Each player's stone is going to be placed on the appropriate mining monument board in a different way, depending on where you're at. Now, the market board's a little different. All it determines is the order the cubes come off is who gets to draft the cards first, second, third, or fourth. Last choice is to play one of those market cards you've gotten in a previous turn. Uh, these are ways you can break the, break the rules, right? So they'll let you load a boat and ship the same turn or pull some stone straight from the quarry and put it on a monument, etc. There's a bunch of different cards. There's a reference sheet right on the back of the instruction book that tells you what they all do. It's interesting. I mean, there's the, the, the size of the cubes, the looks of the cubes, the fact that you're building things out of these cubes. I feel like someone who designed Minecraft really likes Imhotep. <laughs> that is is definitely possible. <laughs> they are from two different companies, though. So yeah, maybe yeah. maybe unless Prospero Hall also worked on uh, or not members I, of Prospero. Not that Hall. I can see. Well, possibly members. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so so each monument board works differently, and each scores differently. Some score points during the game. Others score only at the end of the game. So without getting into full details here, the burial mount as players trying to create orthogonally adjacent sets of their own blocks. Whereas the temple scores based on which blocks can be seen from the top layer of the structure, with each layer of five going on top of the previous one. And then the obelisk scores different from that, and the pyramid scores different than that. After six rounds of play, you do endgame scoring, which includes the monument boards, as well as some of the market cards, which also score at the end of the game. Those tend to be based on what got built in different spots. Builder with most points wins, Imhotep's favor, and wins the game. Excellent. Uh, and I'm just noticing that the uh, the designer for this game also worked on Gizmos and Sushi Go. So yeah, that, uh, definitely, it's, it's, he's your kind of your kind of designer, apparently. Yep. No, oh, I agree. Phil Walker Harding's a great designer. I'm a big fan. Now I've been hooked on Imhotep since the first time I broke it out. I already mentioned this. It was at a bar. It was on a double date night with Tori and Cat at the Sandwich Brewing Company. Um, since then, I brought it out to multiple playing public play game nights. I've had it out on my Monday night games. I've had it out at uh, parties. Um, I played with hardcore Euro players as well as players whose only gaming experience included Sori and Monopoly at the time. And while well, I taught them Go Cuckoo first, so they had a little bit in there. Uh, the only thing that has been common in all these plays is that every single person I've taught this game to has enjoyed it. Excellent. I mean, that's that's pretty uh, pretty hard to beat, right? If yeah. uh, if if you teach it to uh, a wide range of people and everybody can't get mm. enough of it, that's saying something. I mean, yeah. uh... now one of the biggest appeals that I've found is how easy it is to teach this game. Like basically, what I just taught you, the only thing I would have to do in addition to that is explain how the boards work, depending on which sides are up. Like that's it. There's three options: I, I take stone, I put stone, or I ship stone, or I have cards that break those rules. That's it. Like it, it takes under 10 minutes to explain this game and setup is ridiculously quick. You just throw the tiles out, you build the quarry by just dumping all your pieces out. You each take a set of stone, and you start going. The mechanics are dead simple, but what's even more impressive is how deep the strategy and tactics in this game are. Once you start playing, this is one of those games where players have a eureka moment, right? Where you're playing 
and you're like, yeah, 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 I moved stone. You're like, oh, wait, I get it. Oh, there's more to it. And in this game, it's usually when you notice that it's not as much about what you're doing on your own. It's more about watching what everyone else is doing and potentially even more importantly, what you think everyone else is planning to do next. Right. Uh, it's It's great when the game is there in front of you, but the actions and the players are the more important part, right? It's that it's yeah. that interaction where you don't spend the time staring at the board so much mm -hmm. as analyzing the game that has been played and will be played in the future. It's that chess thing, right? It's the you, you don't need to see you don't need to see a chess board for the most part. You just need to know what the moves are and you can picture the whole board in your head. It's that thinking and planning of what's come before and what's coming after to see mm -hmm. where things are going to go that makes uh, for some really great games. And then there's this, the, the fact you have the two-sided boards. That's just a huge bonus. Now, I haven't done the math. I know with the expansion, it's 10 or 1,028 different possibilities. I'm not sure what the combination is in the base game. It should be half that if, if my math is right. But, like, you're going to start off with the A-sides. And there's a reason for that because the A-sides are a little bit simpler. Now, the B-sides aren't harder. But what tends to happen on the B-sides is that you not only get points, you get something else for doing something. So it's a little harder to teach but they're not hard to learn. And it's that ability to combo them. Like literally I saw someone online had written down every possible combination and are crossing them off as they play it because there's no way they're going to play Imhotep a thousand times. So this way each game is going to be unique. And I think right. that's fantastic. That's a crazy amount of replayability. Yep. And, and, and that's assumed. Oh. And even if they are, and even if you don't flip them all, I, I you know, there's still going to be some replayability based on who's at the table with you. Well, yes. Yeah, even if even if you always play with the A sides, I have played many games with the A sides because I'm often teaching new players, and I'm not sick of them. I still have a great time playing. Excellent. So I'm sure you can tell I dig Imhotep. Um, this at this point may just be the best gateway game in my collection. Uh, it's honestly replaced Azul. The the well, for a whole year this podcast we couldn't go a show without talking about Azul. <laughs> But this is now the game I bring to every event where I know there's going to be new gamers. There's a chance there's going to be new gamers showing up and I'm going to have to teach them something new. I, I, the thing is, this is easier to teach than Azul. It's quicker to teach and I find the themes more approachable. Everyone gets building the pyramid, you're stacking blocks. Building obelisks, you stack blocks. It just as opposed to you're building a stained glass thing with this abstract pattern. And I got to say, it's got just about as striking a table presence, though in a different way than Azul. Mm -hmm. Like Azul's got its pretty tiles and its nice tactile. Well, so does this has these nice large wooden blocks. Uh, to me, this game is pretty much a solid buy for any game collection, especially if you often game with newer and inexperienced gamers. If you run a gaming club or if you've got a local game store, this is a game you should have a demo copy available. This is a game that should be available on game nights. Even if you don't play with newer gamers, though, your experienced gamers are likely going to dig this as well. There is enough depth there. So, again, we're here We're here talking about Imhotep. It is rated right now a 7.2. Uh, it's 70th overall in family games. Uh, it's a 40-minute play with a 2.0 rating, basically. So it's accessible, it's quick, uh, and it's well-loved by everyone who's played it, apparently. So... Great for a more at least locally. I've, yeah. I've yet to have someone go, eh, that wasn't for me. And it's heavy enough. We featured it in a board game blitz like this. It's a tournament worthy game because I has one thing, too, that's kind of neat with this game is I have had very different play experiences with it. I've had the play experience where we're having a couple drinks, we're eating charcuterie and we're playing and kind of half paying attention and enjoying the social atmosphere. And I played the heavy game where everyone's sitting, leaning on their, their chins and thinking every move out and trying to predict. And I played a game where it felt almost like a social deduction game where players are lying to each other. We're like, oh, are you going to go ship there? Well, oh, I'll put my boat on there if you ship there. You're going to ship there? Okay, I'll put my stone there. And then they ship somewhere else, right? Like, right. I've actually seen those three different types of gameplay all happen with the same game. Great. Well, for a more in-depth look at Imhotep, head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews.